From genetics to ultrasound, photoscopy to fetal surgery, modern science has granted us an unprecedented look into the development of a preborn child. For example, only eight weeks after conception, around the time many women find out they're pregnant, the baby's heart, which has already been beating for two weeks, now has two chambers. Though less than an inch in length, she has started practicing movements. Her face has begun to take shape. Teeth have begun to develop, along with the legs, arms, feet, hands, and eyes. It's obvious that the developing fetus is no mere blob of tissue, as the abortion industry would like us to believe, but rather a remarkably well-developed baby boy or girl. James Pendergraft came to Orlando to open up a late-term abortion clinic, ostensibly to provide abortions through the 28th week of pregnancy, uh, about 10 years ago. I think that Pendergraft goes out of his way on his website to humanize the infant. He even uses the word baby. And he understands that it's a difficult time for a woman and for parents, and that they, they need to be afforded the time to spend time with their baby after the child is delivered. So it isn't, nobody's arguing about the humanity of the child anymore. That, that just doesn't happen anymore. We know from ultrasound that these are little human beings, and even the abortionist and everybody in the abortion clinic, everyone knows they're a little baby and that they're a little human being. At one point on the website, he actually talks about how even a child with handicaps can be seen as a special blessing by some parents. So the abortionist himself, James Pendergraft, is, is not in any way denying that these children are human beings. Um, the Orlando Women's Center website speaks about how they can help you make arrangements to properly bury the people that they murder. How crazy is that? It's no wonder that on the basis of scientific evidence alone, many experts in the field will echo the opinion of renowned geneticist Dr. Jerome Lejeune. Life has a long history, but each individual has a very neat beginning, the moment of its conception. But while genetic and other medical evidence certainly support the idea that human life begins at conception, the Bible, the very Word of God, and not science, is our ultimate source for truth. And the scriptures make it very, very clear that human life begins and is sacred from the very moment of conception. In fact, it's a fascinating, though very little known truth, that one of the very names of God points to the sanctity of life from the time it begins in the womb. In the 34th chapter of Exodus, Moses appears before the Lord and intercedes on behalf of his people, asking God to reveal his glory. Part of the Lord's response was to reveal to Moses the divine name as well as a key aspect of his nature. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord, the Lord the Lord, a God merciful and gracious. Before I formed you in the womb, in the reckon, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. The womb then, in its original Hebrew context, was not only the matrix, the sacred place where a new human, an image bearer of God, was conceived, formed, nurtured, and then born. It also was and should be treated as a place of mercy. Jesus declared in Matthew 5, 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. But the converse must also be true. When people, for their own convenience, send their swords into that place of life and mercy, defiling the sanctuary of the reckon, the womb, they would do well to consider Christ's sober warning concerning the wages earned by those who use violence to accomplish their own ends. Those who live by the sword shall die by the sword. Among the most profound, world-changing truths we can ever contemplate is that Jesus, the promised Savior of the world, God incarnate, was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. 
When Gabriel announced to Mary that she was to conceive and give birth to the Messiah, she naturally asked how could this be, seeing that she was yet a virgin. The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. But it's what happened next that provides us with the most powerful and irrefutable argument for the personhood and sanctity of preborn life. In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country, to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud voice, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Note several things here. First, Jesus at this moment was well within the first trimester of his development as a fetus, perhaps only just a few weeks or even a few days old. Second, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, her baby, John, the one who would serve to prepare the way for Jesus, moved in some dramatic way while she was simultaneously filled with the Holy Spirit. Now another verse of Scripture comes into play here. When an angel announced to Zechariah, Elizabeth's husband and John's dad, the miraculous conception of John, God's messenger declared something very unusual. He, John, will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. Likely the in utero John was filled with the Holy Spirit at the same moment his mother was, when they heard the voice of Mary, pregnant with a very, very small developing Jesus. Now, a few critically important things need to be understood here. First, only humans, as image bearers of God, can be vessels of the Holy Spirit. The in utero John, as just such a vessel, was recognized by God himself as being fully human. Note also that the scriptures here refer to John as the baby, the Greek word brephos, that leapt in the womb. In the next chapter of Luke, it refers again to a baby, a brephos, but this time it's Jesus, born and now lying in a manger. Intro utero or extra utero, it makes no difference. We're still talking about a baby, a fact that if we're honest with ourselves, is still the way we refer to the preborn today. The documentary film Lake of Fire provided a startling insight into this simple truth as well as the mental gymnastics people who support abortion have to undergo to deny it. Famed attorney, liberal activist, and abortion supporter, Alan Dershowitz. I'll never forget the time when I saw the uh, first pictures of my little daughter and was told by the, the, the doctor that you know she was kind of reaching for the needle as the uh, 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 injection had, had come in because she was being uh, given an amniocytesis. <clears throat> for me, that was a live human being. I regarded my child as live and a person, certainly from this third month or so, but that's because we had made a firm decision that this child was going to be brought into the world. I don't know how I would feel about a three-month-old fetus who the mother said is going to be terminated. Would I think of it as a human being at that point? Uh, this, these, are, these are the hardest questions. These are so according to this so-called logic, one that plays a big part in the abortion on-demand movement, an in utero person doesn't really exist until her parents recognize her personhood and want her to exist. Talk about man playing God. One of the abortionists who works for Dr. Pennegraph, his name is Randall Whitney, uh, told me when I asked him about the fact that the babies are human and that they're moving, when he pulls them out, he happens to do a different kind of a later term abortion where he dismembers them while they're alive, but they don't come out whole. And when I referred to the fact that they were moving while he was dismembering them and they were alive, he looked at me incredulous and he said, Patty, the whole 
purpose of an abortion is to kill the fetus. He thought I was being foolish and ignorant uh, and naive to think that abortion was anything less. If an abortionist is going to do an abortion, he knows he's going to kill a living child. So it seemed foolish to him that I would suggest that it would be anything less. The humanity of the child is really not in question any longer. It used to be when I started to reach out to women who were pregnant about 15 years ago, that a lot of the women seemed to be under the impression that uh, they weren't carrying a child, but they were carrying a group of cells or something that hadn't turned into a child yet. But now the jig is up. We know these little ones in the womb are children. We can see them with ultrasound, especially now with the 3 and 4D ultrasound. And certainly on websites of very known abortionists, such as George Tiller in Kansas, he provides uh, actually very beautiful images of children through all nine months of pregnancy. So the mothers whose babies he murders are confronted with exactly what they're doing and what he's helping them do. Back to the in utero John being filled with the Holy Spirit, we can also see a surprising degree of sentience here on his part. John leapt because he recognized and understood at some deep pre-rational level the presence of Mary and Jesus, a fact that modern neonatologists now recognize from a developmental perspective. In utero children are far more aware of the world both inside and outside the womb than we would have ever imagined, making abortion an even greater abomination. Lastly, note again what Elizabeth said to Mary. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Elizabeth didn't say future mother or mother of the one who will one day be my Lord. Everything was emphatically present tense. Mary was a mother, with child is the common expression, and the Lord Jesus Christ was as fully present at that moment as he was when the Apostle Thomas said almost the same words as he beheld the wounds of the resurrected Christ. My Lord and my God. And there are other verses in Scripture that make the full humanity of the preborn child just as clear. For thou didst form my inward parts, thou didst weave me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. The Lord who made you and formed you in the womb. According to Scripture, abortion is a sin against God, a violation of the Sixth Commandment, you shall not murder. It is the wanton killing of innocent human life in the womb, a place designed by God to be a refuge of life and mercy. And that is precisely why in the Didache, a pastoral manual that represents the early church's understanding and practice concerning everything from baptism to the Eucharist, clearly stated, Thou shalt not procure abortion, nor commit infanticide.